All right, engineers, in this video, we're going to go over in great detail the regulation of the transition stage. So again, um, what happens in the transition stage? So if you remember, we said that there's what's called pyruvate, right? It was formed from the end product of glycolysis. So if you remember from glycolysis, you got this three carbon molecule called pyruvate, all right? And pyruvate, you actually got two of them. So let's actually mark that. You actually got two of them, right? Because pyruvate is a three carbon molecule. And if you remember, glucose was the six carbon starting reactant. And the end product was two pyruvate molecules, which is three carbons. All right. Now, pyruvate, only time it's going to actually enter into the mitochondria and get converted into this next product called acetyl CoA is if there is oxygen present. So we have to remember that. The only way that this reaction, the pyruvate, will be transported in is if there is oxygen present. So there has to be aerobic conditions. That is the only way that this process can occur. What do I mean? You remember those NADHs? Because if you remember, you had those NADHs. Those NADHs that you generated from the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme, right? You actually generated two of them. Eventually, they'll go, and we'll talk about their mechanisms, but they'll unload those electrons onto the electron transport chain. And then they'll get turned it into, into NAD positive. But this is only if there's the presence of oxygen, because those electrons will be eventually dropped onto oxygen as the electron acceptor. If there isn't any oxygen, you guys remember that the NADH gets dropped onto pyruvate and he gets converted into lactic acid. Now, if there's oxygen, that pyruvate is going to move in. And it's going to run into this big, big enzyme complex. What is this, what is this whole enzyme complex here called? It's actually made up of three parts. So for example, you see this guy right there? This is actually what we call enzyme one. We'll actually name them. This one right here is called enzyme two of the enzyme complex. And this one right here is actually going to be enzyme three of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So this whole enzyme right here, this big, big, beastly enzyme, this whole thing here is actually called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. OK? So the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is actually made up of three individual enzymes. One of them is enzyme 1, and we're going to start there. OK, so here's our pyruvate, right? Inside of this enzyme 1, there is a very, very important vitamin. Very, very important. This vitamin that's present in this area is actually called thymine. But specifically, we like to have the thymine bound to two phosphates. So we call that thymine pyrophosphate. So what happens then? Thymine pyrophosphate is going to react with this pyruvate. Look what happens here. So this guy is actually going to react with this pyruvate. As a result of that reaction, so look what happens here. This guy, this pyruvate, is going to react here. As a result of this reaction, look what happens. I pop off a carbon. You know what the form of that carbon is? CO2. So I pop off a carbon in the form of CO2. So I lost the carbon. But the rest of these two carbons are bound onto the thymine pyrophosphate. So let's show that now. So here is our thymine pyrophosphate. And here's our thymine pyrophosphate. But bound to the thymine pyrophosphate is actually going to be what? The breakdown product of the actual pyruvate. So this is going to be our two carbon little acetyl group. So this is our two carbon acetyl group. And this two carbon little acetyl group is going to be bound to the thymine pyrophosphate. Well, guess what? Thymine says, I don't want to hold on to this guy anymore. I think I'm going to pass him back. I'm going to give him away. So he gives that acetyl group away. Who does he give those little acetyl group to? Into the next enzyme complex. You know inside of this enzyme complex, there's a really cool looking guy. Look at this guy. This guy right here is actually called lipoate. And lipoate is really special. The reason why he's special is he has these little like disulfide bonds. Okay, so there's a sulfur bonded between another sulfur bonded to another guy, right? 
So now it's going to have these like little disulfide bonds here. And what happens is the thymine pyrophosphate is going to pass that acetyl group onto this guy. Let's actually do this a different color so that it's not confusing. Let's do this in black. So let's say here I have the lipoate. So here's my lipoate. And on the lipoate, I have these disulfide bonds. This lipoate is going to react with the thymine pyrophosphate and pull off that two carbon chain. And what happens is when it reacts with that, it's going to put that two carbon chain on one, it's going to break that disulfide bond. And look what you get as a result. So here's our lipoate. And then look what happens as a result of this. One of these is going to become a thiol. The other one is going to have the sulfur here. And then as a result, it's going to have attached to it our two little carbon group, our acetyl group, right? And so there's our acetyl group right there. Now look what happens. This guy, he's going to go back to this guy, but in, in, a, in actually a little different way. So let's actually put this guy over here so we can have some room here. So now look what happens. We're going to have this guy over here. Here's our two carbon acetyl group. And then look what happens here. This is pretty cool. This guy is going to give up this actual acetyl group. But on this enzyme, there's another component here. Look at this. Look what I'm going to do now. I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to add on a coenzyme A. You know coenzyme A is actually a derivative of, of vitamin B5, so a pentothenic acid. And what happens is it's actually going to react with this acetyl group. And when it reacts with that acetyl group, look what you get out of as a result of this. You get your two carbon fragment, all right? You get your two carbon fragment, and then attached to it is going to be a CoA. So what's going to be attached to this? A CoA. There's my CoA. You know what this molecule is called? This molecule is called acetyl CoA. Okay, well, we're not done because what happens with this lipoate? Once this lipoate transfers that actual two carbon group onto the CoA, it forms a thiol group. So now you're going to have lipoate. You're going to have this lipoate molecule, but look what he has on him. He's going to have two of these thiol groups, right? Because originally he only had one. When he gets rid of this acetyl group, he gets another thiol group because he pulled hydrogens from this guy. Now, what's going to happen is we can't let those hydrides go to waste. So guess who comes to the rescue? FAD. So FAD is going to come here and it's going to pick up those hydrides. When it picks up the hydrides, it forms FADH2. But we're not done because you know who else would like to be able to pick those up instead? NAD. NAD or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, right? Because FAD is a specifically a derivative of riboflavin, right? So vitamin B2. And then NAD is a derivative of vitamin B3, niacin. Okay? Look what happens here. He comes over and pickpockets those hydrides. And when he pickpockets those hydrides, you generate NADH. And then where does NADH go? You know that he goes to the electron transport chain, right? And drops those hydrides off. That's so cool, right? So this mechanism here, what's happening step by step? And then let's name each enzyme individually. So the first step is what? The pyruvate reacts with the thymine pyrophosphate, gets rid of a CO2. Then you get the thymine pyrophosphate with the little acetyl group there. That reacts with the lipoate or the lipoic acid, which has these disulfide bonds. When it reacts, it takes on the acetyl group and gets converted into lipoate with the thiol group, and then it's bound to the two carbon acetyl group. Then what happens is, when it gets rid of this two carbon acetyl group, because it combines with coenzyme A, you'll form acetyl-CoA. As a result, the lipoate will then get converted into basically a reduced form where it has these thiols. These thiols have hydrides. 
And what happens is FAD picks them up and converts into FADH2. But then NAD positive pickpockets those hydrides and forms NADH. And then that can go to the electron transport chain, right? So this was the second step, and this was the third step. What is each one of these enzyme complexes name? Okay, enzyme one is referred to as pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay, so this enzyme is interesting because sometimes people confuse this one with pyruvate decarboxylase. And the reason why is because you see this enzyme, right? And the automatic thing is, oh, it's decarboxylating the pyruvate to CO2. That's true. But that enzyme is not pyruvate decarboxylase. That enzyme is pyruvate dehydrogenase, okay? Enzyme two. This enzyme is transferring the acetyl groups onto the coenzyme A. But who's doing it? The lipoate. And specifically, the enzyme that's actually doing it is called dihydro lipoamide acetyl transferase. Holy sugar frick. That's a lot. That's a heck of a name, right? So enzyme two is again lipoate, right? Oh, and look, you see how the lipoate, when FAD reacts on the lipoate with the thiol groups, he should return. So he should return back to this original structure. Okay. But the enzyme, dihydrolipoamide acetyl transferase, or sometimes they even call it dihydrolipoil acetyltransferase, what is he doing? This enzyme is taking the acetyl group, transferring onto the lipoate, then lipoate is taking those actual acetyl groups, transferring them with coenzyme made of acetyl-CoA. Then lipoate gets reduced with these thiol groups, right, with those hydrides. FAD picks up those hydrides and gets converted into FADH2. And then NAD positive comes and pickpockets those hydrides and forms NADH. And then whenever these actual lipoate with the thiol groups gets their actual electrons taken from them, they're oxidized and returned back into their disulfide form. Okay? And this enzyme that's ca catalyzing this is dihydrolipoamide acetyltransferase. The third enzyme is taking the actual hydrides from the lipoate. So if it's taking the hydride ions from the lipoate and eventually transferring them on to NADH, well then generally, that whenever there's NADH, remember I told you guys that you should automatically think dehydrogenase? So this enzyme should be called a dihydrolipoamide, or lipoil, whatever you prefer, D hydrogenase. Okay, and all of these three guys make up the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Okay, so that gives us our reaction there. That's how we generate acetyl-CoA, and that's how we use CoA, and that's how we make CO2. Oh, and if you think about it, we should actually be more specific, because this is just for one pyruvate. We have two. So if there's two pyruvates, how many CO2 do you actually generate here? Two. How many CoAs do you actually use in this process? Two. How many acetyl-CoAs do you actually, actually make then? Two. And then how many FADs are getting converted into FADH2s? Two. And then how many NAD positives are getting converted into NADH2? Okay, now we're good. All right, now that we've done that, we, this enzyme is heavily regulated, heavily regulated. How is it regulated? Okay. Enzyme one of PDH complex is the one, the point of regulation. So there's certain enzymes that control his activity. Okay, let's look at this enzyme and let's look at this enzyme. This enzyme right here that's functioning is called pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase. And he's like, yeah, okay, what is this guy doing? Look what he's doing. He takes, you see his hands? His hands are like phosphates. His hands are like phosphates. And he puts a phosphate onto this enzyme one complex. But you know whenever he puts a phosphate onto the enzyme one complex, this enzyme is inhibited. If this enzyme is inhibited, can it trigger this pathway to occur? No. So this enzyme is naturally 
inhibiting this whole enzyme complex. Well, you know that there's actually molecules that control this. It's, it's amazing. You know, um, you can think about it. What is this process trying to do? It's trying to take pyruvate and convert it into acetyl-CoA. So it's trying to drive this actual energy productive pathway. What if we have too much energy? What if we don't need this pathway to occur anymore? So let's say that here he has two little allosteric sites. Here's an allosteric site. Here's an allosteric site. Here's an allosteric site over here. This guy's filled all with them. Allosteric site right there. All right, for right now, we'll just put these allosteric sites there. Okay, so what could be indicators of high amounts of energy production? Well, one indicator would be ATP itself. If you're making too much ATP, that would be a high indicator, that'd be a strong indicator of energy production. And we don't need that, so what is this guy gonna do to him? He's going to stimulate this enzyme. Now you might be thinking, wow, that's weird. I thought we was supposed to inhibit him. If you stimulate this enzyme, what does he do to this enzyme? He inhibits this enzyme. If he inhibits this enzyme, can this pathway occur? No, and so you won't make any more ATP. What about uh, NADH? You know, NADH is also here too. NADH can also bind here because NADH is produced in significant amounts in the Krebs cycle, right? If you're making too much of him, what do you want to do with this guy? Stimulate him. If you stimulate him, it'll inhibit him and you'll decrease the NADH production. What about acetyl-CoA? So what about acetyl-CoA? What can he do? You know, acetyl-CoA can actually bind in here. And acetyl-CoA, if you're making too much of him, you can slow this process down because the whole purpose is to form him. If you want to slow it down, have him directly inhibit him. I'm sorry, not inhibit him, stimulate him, which will inhibit this enzyme. Okay, we're getting somewhere. So again, we got ATP, we got acetyl-CoA, and we got NADH. Other things that can also control this enzyme is actually going to be a very, very interesting concept here. You also have ADP. You know there's adenosine diphosphate. And what is adenosine diphosphate a result of? Remember if you have very little ATP, you make a lot of ADP because you're breaking down a lot of the ATP. So your energy production is decreasing. So you're gonna wanna be able to stimulate this process to occur. So what will ADP do here? It will inhibit this molecule. If you inhibit him, he's no longer gonna keep trying to what? Uh, uh, phosphorylate this molecule. And so this process will actually be stimulated and it'll actually run the reaction. What else? Pyruvate, what about pyruvate? Can't forget about the poor old pyruvate. Pyruvate's kind of sitting out here and he's like, man, I really would like to get converted into acetyl-CoA because there's too much of me. So what would he do to this enzyme? He would inhibit this enzyme. If he inhibits this enzyme, what's that gonna do to this then? It's going to allow for this enzyme to not phosphorylate and then this reaction will occur. Okay, now there's another point here. Look at this. This enzyme one, he actually has pockets directly on him. Look at this. He has pockets directly on him for certain types of molecules. So you know if, if there's actually a lot of, specifically, if there's too much NADH, this guy will inhibit him. If there is too much ATP, this guy will inhibit him. You know these guys are direct inhibitors, but also, look what else? They're also indirect inhibitors. It's pretty darn cool. Okay, that's that part. Now, another thing is, let's come over here to this enzyme and see what this enzyme does first. Okay, this enzyme over here is called PDH phosphatase. So you can imagine, let's pretend that there's a phosphate right here. Remember his hand? Let's say that this is a phosphate, okay? There's a phosphate. PDH phosphatase is really cool because his hand is like pinchers. He's got little pinchers. And what he does is he rips that phosphate off. So he rips the phosphate off of enzyme one. If he rips the phosphate off, what will that do to this enzyme? That will stimulate this enzyme. When would you wanna stimulate this enzyme? When you want this pathway to make a lot of ATP. You know when your muscle cells are actually getting ready to contract? The action potentials will cause the excessive release of calcium ions. And then what does calcium do? Look what calcium does. 
he has a, look at this, he has a pocket here on this enzyme that he comes in and binds to. And when calcium binds onto this enzyme, what is this enzyme going to do? It's going to rip the phosphate off of this enzyme one complex. What's that going to do to this enzyme? Stimulate him. If he's stimulated, what is that going to do? It's going to lead to the formation of acetyl-CoA. That will undergo Krebs cycle activity, make NADHs, FADH2s, and then eventually make ATP. Why is that important? Our muscles can't contract without the ATP. It's a, it's a beautiful mechanism the way this, our body works. Okay, what about hormonal? So we've covered allosteric. What about hormonal? You know there's uh, insulin. Insulin has an effect on these enzymes too. So if you think about it, what happens? Whenever you want to be, so let's say that this enzyme is phosphorylated, right? If this enzyme is, let's say that this enzyme phosphorylates enzyme 1. So who's doing that? Let's say that PDH kinase is phosphorylating the enzyme 1 complex. Well, we know that the PDH phosphatase can pluck that off. You know who can enhance this process besides calcium? Insulin. So insulin also has the ability to stimulate this enzyme through certain types of second messenger processes, right? And then if this enzyme is activated, what will happen? He'll rip off that phosphate. If he pulls the phosphate off, what will happen to this enzyme? He'll be stimulated. And if he's stimulated, he'll lead to the formation of acetyl-CoA. Okay, one more thing I want to mention to you guys just with respect to clinical relevance, because some of you guys might be like, why do I need to know all this crap? I'm not going to have this ever in some type of patient. Yes, you will. You see this right here? Something so small, something so small can cause such a problem with inside of our body. Now, you know thiamine pyrophos uh, pyrophosphate that I mentioned here? Thiamine is very, very, in it's actually important and it's an integral component of this enzyme. If there is a condition, called berry berry you know berry berry is actually not the the berries you're thinking about it's specifically a thymine deficiency and this is a category there's categories of berry berries like wet and dry berry berries but the whole concept of berry berry is that when there's a thymine deficiency this can cause severe neurological complications so this can cause severe neurological complications. What do I mean? Because of the lack of thymine, this can lead to pain, significant pain. This can lead to paralysis of certain types of muscles, and obviously it can lead to death. And because it has effect on our heart too, you know it also can control our specifically the fluid volume, so it can also lead to a lot of edema, a lot of swelling. You know what else is important for thymine? Not with respect to this, but you know whenever there's a deficiency in thymine? Why, how would you get a deficiency in thymine? You know, people who are drinking a lot of alcohol? So if you, let's say that you're just, you keep kicking, you know, the, uh, the 40s back, <laughs> you know, you're going to be inhibiting the actual, and I shouldn't say inhibiting thymine deficiency, I should say alcohol. You know, alcohol is actually really, really uh, not very nutritious at all. It has no nutritional value. So there's a lack of thymine in it. So those individuals who consistently are consuming large amounts of alcohol, alcohol is not rich in vitamins, and so what happens to their thymine composition? It goes down. What else would cause thymine deficiencies? People who would just eat white rice all the time, okay? If all you do is eat a lot of white rice, that's not going to provide for you the thymine that you'll need. One other thing I want to mention about thymine, and just to go show you guys how significant something so small can make on the body. You might have heard of what's called Korsakoff syndrome. Well, specifically Wernick's Korsakoff syndrome. So we'll put it Wernick's Korsakoff syndrome. This is also due to the deficiency in thymine. You know these people develop psychotic problems, neurological and psychological problems. What do I mean? They start to mimic the effects similar to Alzheimer's. People will actually mistake it for Alzheimer's. But what happens with these people is that they're not actually forgetting things. They're making up, they're confabulating. So what does that mean to confabulate? They're making up fabricated information. They're having these vivid conversations about things that have never really happened. All because of the deficiency in thymine. That can cause that problem. So something so small can cause such a significant problem within the body. 
Okay, so again, what's, overall, what's the overall result? Pyruvate is getting converted into acetyl-CoA. It's producing two CO2 as a byproduct, two NADH as a byproduct, and it's using two coenzyme A. Who's regulating this whole pyruvate dehydrogenase complex? PDH kinase. He's generally inhibiting him by phosphorylating him. PDH phosphatase is stimulating him by pulling off the phosphate. Who inhibits him? You'd want to inhibit him like ADP or pyruvate. If you inhibit him, he doesn't phosphorylate and this pathway runs. If you want to stimulate this enzyme, you have high energy composition occurring, right? So high ATP, high NADH, high amounts of acetyl-CoA. This enzyme will be stimulated, but then what happens? This pathway will not occur. And then over here, PDH phosphatase, you'd want to pull that phosphate off, right? Why? Well, insulin wants this process to occur. It wants to drive energy production. Also, calcium. Calcium is important because it's going to be needed for muscle contractions. So it's going to want to drive this process so we can make ATP for the cross bridge formations, the muscle contraction with the myosin and actin. And then again, what are the three parts of the enzyme? The one enzyme one, which is ripping off the actual CO2s and having the thymine pyrophosphate is pyruvate dehydrogenase. The enzyme two with the lipoate with the disulfides and the thiols is the dihydrolipoamide acetyltransferase. And this enzyme three, which is consisting of the FAD and the NAD, is having dihydrolipoamide uh, lipoamide dehydrogenase. And again, thymine deficiencies can lead to Wernick's Kosakoff syndrome, where they can develop uh, uh, psychological complications where they start having confabulations and vivid fabrications of evidence and information, or various different types of beriberi conditions, which can be genetic or could be due to the uh, consumption of alcohol or could be due to uh, consumption of large amounts of white rice. And again, what happens with these people? They develop neurological complications such as pain, paralysis, death, and even swelling of body tissues. All right, engineers, this was a lot of information. I really hope it all made sense. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, leave a comment down in the comment section. We look forward to hearing from you guys. All right, until next time.